Good afternoon, good morning, whatever it is, whenever you uh, are watching this, I am going to get straight to the point. Um, I walked in on my wife last night reading to my son um, this book, a Bible story. Um Although it was not her intent, or maybe even the intent of the author of this book, which is a summation of the chapters of Scripture, she read to my son the saddest story I've ever heard in my life last night. Um, tears welled up in my eyes. I was grieved, and it's been on my mind ever since. And I just wanted to read verbatim what she read to my son and what we need to be reminded of every single day. So bear with me. This is a child's book, and I'm reading it verbatim. Uh, and I'm going to have just a bit of commentary at the end. But let this story not so easily be forgotten or lost on you in your walk with Christ. And even if you are outside of Christ right now, this is how it happened. And whoever this author is did a fantastic job. Before the beginning, there was nothing. It was dark, shapeless nothing. And God then spoke, and he said, let there be light, and there was. And the light of the very first day. On the second day, God made the sky above and the sea below. Next, God called the land from out of the sea, and all kinds of plants began to grow on it. The golden light of the sun warmed the earth in daytime. The silver moon lit the night. Millions of stars twinkled in the heavens. God made the creatures that lived in the sea, the darting fish, the plunging monsters, the things half seen in the ripples. God also made the many birds that soared and flitted and shrieked and twittered. And God made all the animals, the huge and lumbering elephants, the tiny shrewds, the wild and fearsome lions, and the gentle, obedient cattle. Everything God had made was astonishing, amazing, and absolutely perfect. Last of all, God made people. I give you my blessing, God told them. I'm putting you in charge of everything I have made. I want you and your children and your children's children to take care of this world for always. Now the six days of making the world were done. The seventh day was to be special, said God. It would be a day of rest and enjoyment for all of my creation. God named the first man Adam and the first woman Eve. The Garden of e Eden was their paradise home. Everything here is for you to enjoy, said God. The trees are heavy with fruit and it hangs low for you to pick. There's just one tree you must not touch. Its fruit will open your eyes to all kinds of evil. If you eat it, you will die. Why would Adam and Eve even think to disobey? God had given them all they needed to be happy. One day Eve heard a whisper. Look at this delicious fruit. Why did God tell you not to eat it? Because it will poison us, replied Eve. I know better, said the snake. God knows it will make you wise. And God doesn't want that. Eve wondered. The fruit did look appealing. She tried some. And it was delicious. She gave some to Adam. 
in the evening, God came to talk to Adam and Eve, but now they felt ashamed, and they had not obeyed God, and they hid. But God soon found them, so you disobeyed, said God. You cannot stay in paradise any longer. Life will be hard in the world beyond. I will give you animal skins for clothing, but for food, you'll have to farm the land. As Adam and Eve left paradise, they saw an angel with a fiery sword at the gate. Was there no way back? How could they be friends with God again? If that's not the saddest story you've ever heard, then you haven't been as thoughtful as you need to be about what it is to be apart from God before he allows you to become in him, in Christ. What hit me the hardest in this and what made my eyes swell with tears was the last the last thing, how can we be friends with God again? Because the pain and the stress and the cross and a God reincarnating himself on earth and withstanding spit and slaps and punches, having to live in a mortal body even for 33 years is enough. But this is the part that hit me. Let me get to it. I have all these pages. It's really hard, right? Yeah. It says, everything here is for you to enjoy. The trees are heavy with fruit, and it hangs low for you to pick. God's original intent was for us to enjoy, to live in harmony, to live in peace, to have it easy, a a good, good father who gave good, good gifts and intended to be in perfect harmony, in perfect community, and did not desire us to work even. There was no working. If it is heavy with fruit and even it hangs low for you, there's no work. There's no shame. There's complete reliance. He had sons and daughter. He had a son and a daughter. And he loved them. And he showed love to them. There was no discipline. There was no, there was no lessons. It was just pure, adulterated love. Unadulterated love. Unblemished. He gave us complete dominion. He gave us complete power to cultivate and to rule over this land and none of it would be work. And we lost that place. What a sad, sad day. When we were banished, how can we become friends with God again? And we see after that the tumbling of mankind in, in, in Genesis chapter 6. He's like, I wish I would never even made these people. They're so evil. And if you go to the snake, all he did to Eve was so just the smallest bit of doubt. And that part disgusted me because I've seen people walk forward in, in, in church services and even confess to me the evil that is that is that has become in their lives, and they are so ashamed. And it all started with this wretched, disgusting, degenerated, cursed snake serpent fallen angel creation who rejected god and he is responsible he is responsible we should hate him and we should armor up because guess what he doesn't come with a sword himself he comes with a whisper he looks for a chink he comes with a needle, not a sword, right? He just wants to find a small space to puncture you, to create space. 
That's what he wants. He wants to create space between you and God, create doubt between you and your faith. That's what he wants to do. And the smallest giving in to Satan, the smallest giving in, the word, the cuss word, the movie, the drink. You know, teetotalers get a really bad rap, and they shouldn't. It's like, so long as you don't push that on other people, I get it, man. Why wouldn't you want to reject any and everything that could create a pathway for, for sin in your life? If it's not sin, but it could become sin, why are we even entertaining it? Was it sin for Eve to wonder and to look at the fruit as appealing? Okay? It said Eve wondered. The fruit did look appealing. Was it bad for her to look and to wonder? Was it a sin? No, she had not sinned until she grasped the fruit and sunk her teeth into it and made the claim that it was delicious. So much so that she offered it to someone else. That's what we do in our life. We wonder. We let doubt enter into our minds. We, we, allow, we allow the fruit to look appealing to us. And because we've entertained sin, now it takes root. There's a scripture somewhere in here that it says it, it, has, it actually shows how sin works in the life of a man. And it says that it's essentially entertained and then, and then it's, it's, you become pregnant with the sin and then the sin is born. And it all starts by contemplation, by doubt, by that moment of, of, of maybe you haven't spent time meditating in the word that morning. You skipped it. You, you didn't feel like you needed to be edified that morning. You got too busy. Well, brother, what's more busy than protecting your soul or protecting your mind from the attack of Satan? There's nothing more important. And especially if you have kids now that are relying on you and they're going to be looking to you to determine what is right and what is wrong. What does dad do and what does dad not do? That must be right or wrong. Your responsibility is ratcheted up whenever you have kids, and that's hit me like a ton of bricks over the past five weeks, realizing that I'm about to have some eyes in here that comprehend what their daddy does behind closed doors. He will know. You might not, but he will know. He will know when I lose patience. He will know how I treat my wife. He will know when I did not strap on that armor in the morning time, and that will have an effect on how he views God, me, and everything else. I want him, I want you, I want everybody to look at me and say, like, imitate that guy as he imitates Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. I want you to be encouraged by this very sad story, and I want you to give it a good ending by repenting of your sin. If you haven't ever done it, repent of your sin and be baptized for the remission of your sin. If you've, if you've, acted on a faith that you had in the beginning and you have backslidden and you need to repent, the way to, to make this right again is to repent and come to him. Extinguish all sin from your life. Don't play with it. Don't entertain it. Don't wonder about it. God has already made this a happy ending. He, 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 he wrote revelation through the hand of John. And so we know how this ends. His people will be redeemed and glorified because they will be justified, sanctified, and then glorified before him and removed from sin altogether. And paradise will come again here on earth and we will get to live as he originally intended. Are you going to be there? You won't if you, if you do not repent. You will not be there if you don't repent of your sin. You're going to get there based on some mental ascent to your faith, and you're going to think that that was enough? Let me tell you, reverse engineer that. What if there was a man who said that they lived as if God existed but never professed his name with their mouth? Do they make it? No, they don't. They lived as if God existed. They bared human fruit. That just sounds like a good person to me. Whose name were they doing it in? In whose name? Theirs? It's not enough. Mental sin is not enough. 
if you're relying on the sinner's prayer to save you, it's nowhere in the Bible. I challenge you to find it. I challenge you. Find it. The preachers that I listen to most often just so happen to be Reformed Baptists. Just so happen to be. I think they push out the best and most accurate content online. Um, they seem to be the most zealous for Scripture. <laughs> and maybe I'm looking in all the wrong places, but they are related to my other Baptist friends who rely on that sinner's prayer sometimes. Just a small sect of the Baptist tradition. Stop it. Stop that. Repent. How about that? Repent. Live a life that glorifies God. That's not legalism. That's a commandment. And he says in John, if you love me, you'll follow my commandments. If you don't love me, you won't. You got to love yourself first. You got to love people. And you got to love him above everything. That's not mental assent. That's obedience. Obedience comes because you are full of faith. So, there it is. Sad story, but it has a happy ending, and it ends with you being at peace with God. Now, heaven is the destination. It's not your reward. Your reward is here on earth. You can live at peace with him now. Not exactly like this, but it is a dim, dim shadow of, of the things to come, and you can be at peace with him now. You can live as if you're in the garden, but it'll never be that good until we're glorified and removed from sin. We'll never get to pick from the low fruit. we still got to work. We're still going to have to endure the, the malevolence of the world, the trials, the tribulations, the things that are promised in the book of John. But take heart. He has overcome the world. He is there for you. He will never leave you. He has chosen you, set you apart, made you anew. So, I love you. Nothing you can do about it. Repent. Come back to him. Draw near. See ya.